let us now look at a couple of uh, interesting concepts uh, that are very important for the overall usage of uh, microcontrollers. We are talking about interrupts and ex exceptions. Okay. So, what is an interrupt? The idea is that you have a CPU that is doing its work. What, what work? Well, it is fetching instructions, decoding them, executing them, modifying memory as requested by those instructions and so on. Right. But there are external agents that are constantly poking the CPU. It could be a reset condition, it could be some kind of a timer that you know is causing a particular pin to go high at regular intervals. It could be a communication, maybe there was something coming in on a UART or some other kind of peripheral that needs attention that basically you know uh, wants the CPU to look into it. The important point is the kind of changes that we are talking about over here are asynchronous. The CPU cannot sort of predict ahead of time when they will come. More importantly, they may not even be aligned with whatever the CPU is currently doing at the moment. Right? It may not even be aligned with the clock that is being used inside the CPU in order to execute instructions. It might come literally in the middle of an instruction that the CPU is currently performing. Okay. What is done in such a case is that we use, uh, we do not sort of just ignore them. We find that you know these kind of interrupts can actually be put to a lot of good use. The simple way to do it is by writing some piece of code called an interrupt service routine. Right. So, what happens is that the normal flow of control in a processor is program counter fetches instructions program counter increments, fetches next instruction, program counter increments, fetch next instruction and so on, right. Unless you have a branch in which case program counter jumps to new location, fetches instruction, executes and so on. But when you get an interrupt, you actually need some kind of hardware support that says, hey, hold on, let me just save the present state of where we are, right. Just take the value of the program counter that we are at currently, save it somewhere, right either into a register or somewhere in the memory of the system and now do something corresponding to whatever interrupt came along, right. I need to jump to a new address because after all the only thing that a CPU knows how to do is fetch instructions and execute them. So, the interrupt that came along must also get translated in some way into a process by which I fetch instructions and execute them. So, what I am going to do is say that hey, if an interrupt comes jump to a specific address corresponding to that interrupt, right. Now, the point is there can be different kinds of interrupts, right. And this new address to which I jump is something called an interrupt vector. Why not call it an interrupt pointer? An interrupt pointer is probably a more accurate term given that we are using the word pointer for all other addresses. In this particular case, historically it is called an interrupt vector. But the interesting thing is I can now have different interrupt vectors for different interrupts. What kind of interrupts? Well, I could have an interrupt which came about because somebody pressed a reset button. I might have another interrupt simply because you know one of the GPIOs went from 0 to 1. I might have an interrupt because the UART received some data and decides that it wants to wake the processor up. I might have an interrupt because a timer peripheral sort of you know counted down some number and then decided to wake up the processor. All of those come as different pins somewhere in the logic of my processor, right? Or through some kind of a mechanism called an interrupt controller, right? Either way, the processor what it gets is it gets to know something called which interrupt actually occurred at a given point in time, right? And if it knows the interrupt number, I can use a table, a lookup table, in order to convert that number into an address to which to jump. In other words, if I get a push button being pressed, I should go and do run a particular function. Instead, if it was a timer interrupt that came along, I should run some other function. Right? All of that can be handled very cleanly through the use of a vector table for different interrupts, which just contains a set of pointers to which to jump and execute code. This type of code is called an interrupt service routine and plays a very important part especially in the context of how microcontroller based systems are built.
Now, there is one thing that you can do with interrupts, which is that there is a possibility to mask interrupts. Masking is basically the equivalent of a do not disturb sign, right? It basically says the processor does not want to be disturbed by an interrupt. I can either selectively or collectively disable interrupts. I can either disable all the interrupts or I can say I don't want this kind of interrupt to come through, right? But you have to be very careful when you use this kind of interrupt masking for the simple reason that there are certain contexts in which you need some way of getting the processor out of you know some place where it is stuck. So in particular things like a reset at least you should not be able to even mask, right? There should be some way by which you say that hey you know this always has to be responded to. Now a reset is slightly different. It may not even be thought of as an interrupt as such. You literally sort of force the program counter to zero. But another way of doing it is by using something called non-maskable interrupts. And many processors do have some way by which you can create non-maskable interrupts. Not all of them, right? There are certain processors that do not really have a notion of something called a non-maskable interrupt, but it can be useful in different contexts. Now, so far I've talked about interrupts, right? There is also another variant or a different uh, related concept called an exception. Now, an exception is something which is internal to the CPU. It's not something that's coming from the outside world. Examples of exceptions are, for example, when you do divide by zero, or let's say you encounter an undefined instruction, right? The program counter points to a location in memory, loads that into the, uh, you know, the decode logic of the CPU, and the CPU can't interpret it. It doesn't look like any known instruction, right? What should it do? Should it just ignore it and continue moving forward? What usually happens in most processors is that it actually creates something called an undefined instruction exception. Now, the primary difference between an exception and an interrupt is that exceptions are synchronous. As you can see from these examples, they are related to the instructions that are actually running inside the processor, right? So they are synchronized with the clock the processor is working at. And in a lot of cases, you know, they are sort of internally generated, right? They're typically internally generated. Once again, exception handlers, just like interrupt service routines, are also software routines. You could have some kind of an exception vector table, but you know all that you need really is some way by which, given the exception, you should have some way of finding the function to be run, saving the present context, and jumping to that function so that you know. Let's say I have a divide by zero. Either I can try to print out a message on the screen saying "Don't divide by zero." or I can halt my entire system or I can just you know ignore it and move on and say okay you know I encountered a divide by zero I'm going to treat this as an infinity or a not a number or some other way of dealing with it right all of those can be done in software without requiring any ex extra hardware support. Now exceptions as well as interrupts have a lot of commonalities effectively they are exceptions right to the normal flow of control of the processor right now there is a possibility that more than one interrupt or exception can occur simultaneously and what i mean by simultaneously is not exactly at the same time instant but possibly while one is being processed another one also comes along or you know because maybe the cpu is in some slow mode or something like that two interrupts actually come close enough that it's difficult to find out which one came first now, what do you do in such a scenario? Do you just pick one and you know say, okay, this is the interrupt that I decided came first? What is usually done is that you prioritize, right? And you figure out that, okay, maybe some interrupts like a reset or uh, you know uh, some kind of a non-maskable interrupt is a very high priority. Or I might decide that timers have higher priority than let's say a UART, right? And by doing that, what we can do is we can either choose to queue up all the other interrupts and finish them one after the other, or I can just say that, hey, I'll handle the most important interrupts and possibly even just discard whatever remains after that. Okay. In this context, the idea of nesting interrupts, where while I am handling one particular interrupt, the next one comes along. That's also an important concept to understand, right? And that brings in the notion of so-called re-entrant service routines which basically says that while I am in the middle of a service routine, an interrupt service routine, I may need to actually go in there and handle another service routine. 
not all interrupt service routines can be made re-entrant. There can be scenarios where while you are handling a particular interrupt, if another interrupt comes along and you try to handle it, it can actually cause instability or you know cause the problem to uh, cause the entire system to behave in unpredictable or unknown ways or undefined ways, right? So creating ISRs that are re-entrant is not by itself a trivial task. It requires quite a bit of resource and state management, but it, it's very often required, especially in the context of things like operating systems. For now, we are not really getting into how to write ISRs, right? At this point, all that we are talking about is the idea of interrupts, where they occur and why they occur, right? And also a little bit about, you know, one particular piece of information that you need to keep in mind with regard to ISRs is, in general, they sh the response to this, because of the fact that they are exceptional behavior, they are not, you know, the normal flow of the uh, system, the response to an ISR should typically be kept as short as possible. You do not want to respond to an interrupt and then start running some kind of long computation that will take ages to finish. Because what that means is that during that time, if another interrupt comes along, you again have the problem with three entrant uh, ISRs. And more importantly, the actual work that you are doing would never get done because interrupts typically break whatever normal flow of computation that you are doing. And you are unlikely to get back to it if you are going to take a lot of time in the ISR itself. Right? Usually what is done in that case is rather than trying to handle everything immediately as soon as the interrupt happened, you just sort of set some kind of action flag in some kind of operating system table and say, hey, this needs to be handled. Maybe, you know, there is data coming in from the UART. You tell the operating system, there is data sitting somewhere in a buffer, go and fetch it and, you know, move it out into some safe location. But the actual taking the data and copying it somewhere else maybe takes many hundreds of clock cycles. So you don't want to spend that time inside the ISR right now. You will come back to it later when there is free time from something else. So interrupts and exceptions are a core part of how a processor works. And in fact, as we go forward, we'll see that, you know, even the basic idea of executing more than one program, of having some kind of an operating system that can multitask, requires you to have some support in hardware in the form of interrupts, especially timers. So for the time being, we are not really getting into the actual implementation of ISR code. At some point, we will be looking at examples of that as well.